I am Damascene. For if you dissected my body, grapevines and apples would flow. And if you opened my veins with your scalpel, you would hear in my blood the voices of those who have departed. The minarets of Damascus cry as they embrace me, for minarets, like trees, have souls. Coffee grinders are part of our childhood. Oh, how could I forget when the scent of cardamom is so strong? Here are my roots. Here is my heart. Here is my language. So how can I clarify? What is clarification in matters of love? These evocative verses were composed by Niza Kabani, a native of Damascus and one of the Arab world's most beloved and revered contemporary poets. The poem helps set the stage for an in-depth exploration of this room from Damascus, recently acquired by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. A residential reception room from a well-to-do home in 18th century Damascus. It too evokes the sights, sounds, scents, and emotions of this great city. The city of Damascus is renowned for over 6,000 years of documented history, and from 635 onward, it was ruled by a number of Islamic dynasties. The later period of Ottoman rule, the 18th and 19th centuries, presents a unique window into the private spaces of the city, the homes in which affluent Damascenes lived their lives. Some of these homes with their characteristically grand reception room have survived, as have their descriptions by contemporaries. In 1717, Ibn Kanan, a teacher and historian living in Damascus, wrote proudly of his own home. The construction of the reception hall was completed. It came to be of extraordinary beauty and grace. It was done in the best of brilliant paints, with ornamented bookcases, extensive calligraphy, the most elegant furniture, and colored and decorated plaster. While the exact appearance of Ibn Kanan's prized reception hall remains unknown, it likely resembled the Damascus Room at Lakma, a quintessential 18th century interior. In 1900, approximately 17,000 courtyard homes survived, but in recent years, only 600 have been surveyed in the old city. Several notable examples have been restored while others have been transformed into museums, cultural institutions, and even hotels and restaurants. The grandeur of these homes cannot be gleaned from the plain facades that face the narrow, maze-like streets of old Damascus. It is only from the air that one can truly appreciate the courtyards of all shapes and sizes that form the heart of a Damascene home. These courtyards are distinguished by their geometric marble pavements, bubbling fountains, fragrant trees and flower beds, vines, and colorful facades. A massive vaulted hall known as an Iwan, a sitting room of sorts, opened onto the courtyard. Here, residents would be shaded from the sun, yet still enjoy a breeze and the wonderful scents of the courtyard's citrus trees and jasmine. Around the courtyard are doors leading into various types of interiors, including a rectangular hall divided into two parts, of which Lakma's room is an excellent example. The room at Lakma, which measures 20 by 15 feet, is comprised of a low reception area called the Ataba and an upper seating area called the Taza. These two sections are divided by a marble stair riser and a soaring arch 
constructed of 28 blocks of cast plaster, supported by a matched pair of carved and glazed ceramic capitals depicting an elaborate cupola flanked by minarets. The four walls of the room are comprised of dozens of richly decorated wood panels. On the most elaborate of these panels, a paste of gypsum and animal glue was applied to create raised designs. The resulting textured surface was then covered in tin or copper leaf and further embellished with colored glazes like emerald green or shimmering yellow. This complex approach to surface decoration, known as ajamine, is the hallmark technique of the Damascene interior, the final effect of which is a dynamic play of color, light, and metallic sheen. The upper walls of the room are decorated with a series of calligraphic panels of Arabic poetry. The verses are from an ode written in the late 13th century by an Egyptian poet known as Al-Buziri. The final panel concludes with the date the room was made, 1180 Hijri, or 1766 to 1767 AD. In its original context, the wood walls of the room, topped by their cornices and a narrow ledge, would have transitioned into a clear story made of whitewashed walls and stained glass windows. Above that, two wood ceilings, separated by the soaring arch, would have hovered like floating carpets, their visual impact heightened by the plain clear story below. Lakma's Damascus room originally belonged to a house in Albaza, a once quiet and sparsely populated neighborhood located northwest of the old city of Damascus along the Barada River. After the mid-19th century, as the city center shifted westward, Albasa became more urbanized, and by the early 20th century, this quarter was connected to the rest of the city by a new tramway line. In the 1970s and early 1980s, the neighborhood of Albasa was subject to further urban development projects. According to documents provided to LACMA, the house, which belonged to the family of Muhammad Salim al Murabe was slated to be torn down to make way for the construction of a new road. On this account, in 1978, the home's reception hall was disassembled and sold to an antiquities dealer. The room was subsequently exported from Syria to Beirut, Lebanon, where it remained in storage for more than 30 years. Around 2011, the room was brought to London, where Lachmas, curator of Islamic art, first saw it. The room was nearly complete and in good condition. It seemed that LACMA was presented with the rare opportunity to help preserve the cultural heritage of one of the world's most important cities, while adding a key work of art to its collection. The Damascus Room, as we see it today, is the culmination of four years of intensive research and conservation efforts by a collaborative team of curators, conservators, engineers, historians, and scientists at LACMA and elsewhere. For over a year in Los Angeles, the room's painted wood panels were meticulously consolidated and cleaned by conservators who used a variety of methods to remove surface dirt. The room's wall fountain, including its elaborately carved hood, was also cleaned by a team of conservators at LACMA, and then later reassembled and installed by masonry experts. The marble floor tiles were also cleaned and then arranged and installed in a manner reflecting the aesthetics of 18th century interiors. Conservators at LACMA analyzed various paint pigments and found them to be consistent with the mid-18th century date of the room. Identified pigments included carbon black, lead-based pigments for white, copper-based pigments for green, organic colorants for red and blue, the mineral orpiment for yellow, and a form of cobalt glass powder known as smalt. Unlike most extant Damascus rooms, the LACMA room was not given a coat of varnish in modern times. Though meant to refresh and protect the painted surface, the varnish, as it ages, causes colors to darken, 
and the resultant surface gloss disrupts the finely balanced contrasts between matte, lustrous, and glossy details. Luckily, this was not the fate of the Lacma room. Now cleaned, the bright and vibrant color palette accurately reflects the visual aesthetic of the 18th century Damascene home. The result of LACMA's conservation project is the unveiling of an exuberantly colorful interior, unparalleled outside of Damascus itself. After the room's painted wood services were conserved, they were mounted on a custom-made metal armature that could be disassembled for packing, shipping, and reinstallation. This remarkable mounting system makes LACMA's interior the first ever portable Damascene period room, allowing it to be displayed at other museums in the future. In 1756, Alexander Russell, a British physician living in Syria, wrote of rooms like this one, saying, The divan is formed in the following manner. Across the upper end and along the sides of the room is fixed a wooden platform, four feet broad and six inches high. Upon this are laid cotton mattresses exactly of the same breadth, and over these a cover of broad cloth trimmed with gold lace and fringes hanging over the ground. A number of large oblong cushions, stuffed hard with cotton and faced with flowered velvet, are then arranged on the platform close to the wall. The terrace floor in the middle, being first matted, is covered with the finest carpets of Persia and Turkey. In the process of converting LACMA's Damascus room from a domestic interior into a museum period room open to the public, we too have made modifications based on the practical circumstances, requirements and tastes of its present function and context. This process is ongoing and with the advancement of scholarship and the integration of new technology, the Damascus Room at LACMA will continue to evolve, as can be seen in this latest iteration. For now, though, the room offers a chance for visitors to temporarily escape from the hustle and bustle of modern times and to enjoy, for a moment, a glimpse into a once secluded world we can be transported back in time to imagine and experience the gracious hospitality of the Damascene home. <laughs>